I'll just ask a few questions. I first wanted to just uh, mention that this is a, you know, from production to distribution exhibition, this is a truly independent event. First, you know, this is, and Whit, if he wants to talk about it, this is a purely independent, independently financed film yeah. uh, from him. Uh, but it's also, this is uh, being distributed in its re-release by uh, Rialto Pictures, uh, a small unit that we're helping support here. And in addition, this is also being exhibited by the largest independent uh, exhibition circuit in the country, uh, who has uh, established a relationship with us at the Department of English and has provided the facilities here uh, for free to be able to screen this and for us to enjoy a conversation. So up and down the line. So we are the Americans. Yes. It's our host. Yes. Let's thank Harkins. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> thank God. Uh, thank Dan. Uh, so um, this well, is... Buy some popcorn on the way out. <laughs> buy some popcorn. Yes, buy some popcorn. Uh, so we're, we're looking at, we had the re-release 25 years, uh, you know, two years ago, and now we're in its 27th years. And I just kind of the question is, well, how do you explain the, the resonance that uh, this film has over 27 years? Well, this film, I think, was developed by the fact that always it was sort of a retrospective film. It was always looking back to an earlier time. We don't specify it because we didn't have enough money to make a period film. We could just sort of suggest that it's not 1989 film when we were shooting it. And so in a sense, since it was already the past, it, it stays now in, in the past just 27 years on. I mean, 26 and a half years on. And so um, I think that helped you know, give it that you know, preserved and amber quality. Because I know you've talked a lot about uh, how doing this on a very low budget how you were able to kind of steal shots, how are you how are you able to find shortcuts and trying to capture a past time, but not with a lot of money uh, to do so. Can you explain just in this movie some of those techniques you use to capture a moment before, but with a very, very little budget? Well, I'm not sure how many people here are sort of interested in doing their own films and things like that, but I always found very inspiring reading about the early years of, of cinema when they would do things like, I think the Keystone um, crowd, Max Sennett, they would hear that there's gonna be a parade in town and they'd get their actors and the camera and they would think of some business and they'd just go do the action in front of the parade. So they'd have all the production value of the parade behind them and, and sort of capture that. So I think like when something is starting you know, with, with small means, they use ingenuity to capture things that are interesting. And so for us, in the, in the winter of 88, 89, it was, it was sort of Christmas 88, New Year's 89, that we started shooting. <clears throat> and um, we'd sort of hoped to be up and running by Christmas time to get all that Christmas atmosphere. But uh, we really weren't ready yet. But um, we, we went out with uh, a camera, I think it was, uh, an assistant, um, the cinematographer and I did the daytime stuff, um, capturing little glimpses of New York at Christmas time, stealing shots around, and um, I think we probably had a permit or something, but it was just whatever we saw in New York. And then um, between Christmas and New Year's, there was going to be this dance um, that's discussed in the film, the Airsats dance, the uh, international debutante ball with the uh, with the cadets and the Texas debutantes. And we knew that was gonna be at the Waldorf Astoria. So, and at that point we had no assistant, it was just me and the cinematographer. And I knew nothing about cinema, so all I could do was sort of carry the box and stand there and put up the tripod. And he was really doing all the work. So we filmed um, the people going into the debutante party at the Waldorf, and then we had sort of three more hours until they'd be coming out. And so we went and shot the front of the plaza and we shot the windows on Fifth Avenue. <clears throat> and I think we saw a window with the Jane Austen set in what was then Brentano's bookstore, but it had historically been a New York landmark, Scribner's bookstore. And um, then um, we went back and shot these um, girls and their, de de their escorts coming out of the Waldorf in these beautiful um, dresses and stuff. And then we looked at the dailies the next day. We also drove around New York in a car, did all this stuff. So much of the footage we shot was just terrible. All the stuff that we shot in the car, I think me driving and him 
doing handheld, looking out the window at New York. I mean, it was just much too bouncy. <clears throat> and then it turns out that this free camera we had from Duart Film Laboratory, so their deal was if we would do the blow up to 35, we're shooting Super 16. If we do the blow up at their laboratory, they'd give us the Super 16 camera for free. But what they didn't tell us was that the key 20 millimeter lens, which is the key lens for a Super 16 camera, failed in low light conditions. And we were only shooting in low light conditions, so everything was a failure. And so everything was out of focus outside the Waldorf. Um, and it was just heartbreaking after all, all this. But then the editor later on found out that by doing montages with that soft focus stuff, it looked like it was atmospheric. <laughs> but put music and montage uh, dissolves. You did dissolves of that, and it looks like it's intentional effect. And um, then we cut in for one, we represented one party just by having the outside of the plaza and the music going on inside. And then another party that we thought we were going to have to shoot some footage of, we just have sort of a, a, a winter window in one of, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue or Macy's or something in which there are little figures dancing around. And we saved money on having an actual dance with that. So we used all these, you know, found things in, in the movie. And then, you know, Audrey Rouget walking around um, Manhattan looking sad. And then we got the rights to use these two wonderful, obscure soul songs. And since we really couldn't afford to have many songs, we used each one three times. We got a, a deal to do, use each song three times. Dry Your Eyes and, uh, and, and another one. And uh, so it was just piecing these things together. But it kind of helped us, you know, these diverse elements in the film. And I like the, the one found thing uh, story that you had shared with us. Uh, because it was a non-union shoot, if you can just briefly explain how you found that person who opens Audrey's mother who opens oh, the movie. Yeah. So one of our, I mean, so the really good thing about shooting a film um, in this age group is that there's just tons of actors in New York um, who can play 18 and 19 year olds. So they might be from 18, or from 17 to 26, that's the age range in the film. Um, there are tons of actors in this age range, and so they all turned out, there are hundreds of people who came to our auditions, and fantastic. But because we're a non-union film and kind of a non-budget film, um, we couldn't have SAG actors or professional older actors to play the parents. And so um, one day, there's a beautiful actress who plays Cynthia, who is enamored of Von Sloniker, and she's in the last scene with her bikini and all that. She's a beautiful Isabel Gillies. <clears throat> and um, Isabel Gillies' mother, um, Linda Gillies, came to set one day to wish her daughter a happy birthday or something like that, and we say, you know, Mrs. Gillies, um, would you consider playing uh, Audrey Rouget's mother in the first scene of the movie? And so she accepted to help her daughter out in this first film, and she's very nervous. And, uh, and we cut a lot of stuff out of that, and we actually thought of cutting the whole scene, we thought it looked very awkward. But then when we cut that scene out, the next thing looked awkward, and then if we cut that out, the next thing looked awkward. So we just decided, we're gonna have an awkward scene at the start of the film. And I think one thing we learned is that you can have a slightly awkward scene at the beginning of the film, but you don't want it in the middle of the film. And so we had that, and then the um, mother of Tom Townsend. So Tom Townsend, played by Ed Clements, and he was an acting student who was 25, looked younger. <clears throat> and the only person we could find to play his mother, who sort of looked like him in coloring, and that was kind of wonderful, was a 30-year-old actress. So we have a 30-year-old actress playing the mother of a 25-year-old actor. <laughs> and, uh, and it sort of worked. Wait, I have a kind of content question. Oh, uh, no, or you content. could do a theme uh, question. Uh, toys and books are so central to this, and obviously the idea of coming of age and childhood and adulthood. Which toys, which books, and, and do you think of those as important elements of this film? Yes, but I mean, are there more toys than just the ones he finds in the box? Uh, what the was the toys? Raggedy Ann doll next okay. to the Okay, you Jim noticed that. I, 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 so um, Devaney, who's very observant, unlike me, um, noticed that in the shot of the Jane Austen box set in Brentano's window, historically Scribner's window, there is a Raggedy Ann doll. And a jump rope and a building block? I mean, so it's, it's childhood, I too. completely spaced on the fact there's anything other than a Jane Austen box set. I was just interested in the Jane Austen box set. I didn't see that. And um, 
we do have the idea of this sort of maudlin story of Tom Townsend and his father leaving town. Um, he goes to Santa Fe, doesn't he, or something That's like that? That's right. He goes to Santa Fe, warm weather, um, and without telling him. And they have moved out, and they've just thrown uh, his precious toys with a kind of crucial derringer. Because mm -hmm. there's a film rule, if you show a, a gun in the first reel, you have to use it by the, so I, we follow that rule. If you show a derringer in the first reel or in the second reel, you have to sh use it by the end of the movie. <clears throat> and, um, uh, you know, that that was important. You know, that was, that was a good way of doing the maudlin stuff. I also shot a truly maudlin scene of um, Tom Townsend calling his father, Dad, you moved without telling me. And the line producer, when he saw the first assembly, uh, I think just on the Steenbeck uh, editing, editing machine, he saw that. He said, "Wait, I've got an idea for that scene. Take that scene, cut it, and mail it to your father, <laughs> and just don't have it in the film." And we didn't do that because when we were editing the scene of the girls talking to Tom Townsend, they call him to ask him to come to some party. Um, and the girls were all in, in my uh, multicolored sweaters. They look really ridiculous. Um, we didn't have any image of Tom Townsend talking to them. And it, was re it really was weird. And so in that footage of the maudlin talk, for some reason, he sort of seemed to smile. And so he took the little shot of Tom Townsend smiling in the conversation with the father, the maudlin conversation, and edited it into the conversation with the girls, and it's like he's smiling and talking to the girls about coming to the dance. And just one follow-up to that, of course, a Jane Austen question, right? Uh, and there's this review that... Do people know that Devin is a Jane Austen expert? World-renowned? He's so book, kind. With a book coming out? What's your book called? The Making of Jane Austen? The Making maybe? of Jane Austen. That's a good title. Out in June. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, how she became an icon. Yeah. And part of it's through your film. I mean, I think you're contributing to this project of making her an icon, perpetually an icon. So what one reviewer said, your uh, use of Jane Austen almost made her into a character in the film. And I'm wondering how you would reply to that or how you imagine her as um, a foundational or an influential part of this film and the film the story. I, I don't think it's foundational, but it was very helpful because I was struggling writing for a script, not knowing at all if I get to the end or what would happen. And you're just looking for material that kind of works. And I remember this absurd um, <clears throat> conversation with a friend of mine who's incredibly erudite and disciplined and a wonderful reader, but he often gets things wrong. And so um, he, uh, I think at one point I told him I really like Mansfield Park, and he said, oh, how can you like Mansfield Park? Lionel Trilling destroyed Mansfield Park. Uh, he said, like, how can we today take seriously a novel in which, you know, a character doesn't think it's moral to have private theatricals. It's absurd, and we today cannot. <clears throat> so I was really angry at Lionel Schilling for a while, and then I read the, the essay, and it turns out he just says that at the beginning in order to completely knock it down. And um, so I was thinking, you know, this would be a good debate conversation between uh, Tom Townsend and Audrey Rouget. And then so often what helps you in film comedies, if they're sort of talky intellectual or whatever, um, pretentiously uh, uh, thoughtful. Uh, if if you end, if you begin a theme, you suddenly see other ways of using it later on. So the idea of the truth or dare game, um, with her objecting to it and being isolated by objecting to it, and that's the parallel to Fanny Price objecting to the private theatricals when her uncle, who disapproves, disapproves of them, is not there. And so there were like three things helping us out in the film by Jane Austen. And one of the tricks we try to have in our films is to refer to things that a lot of people know about. A lot of people know about Jane Austen. A lot of people know about Bambi and, um, and Uncle Scrooge and, um, and Lady and the Tramp. So in Last Days of Disco, it's all Disney films. And so it's just subjects to talk about that some people know about. <clears throat> and one of the critics who didn't like the film when it came out, um, uh, I was sort of surprised he, he didn't like it, and uh, and I asked him, and he, he said, well, one of the things is I came to love cinema because I couldn't read. I couldn't read books, 
And um, so through cinema, um, I became kind of a writer and a critic. And because I think one of the tricks of Metropolitan as the first film was it's sort of catnip for bookish people. And so a lot of film critics are kind of bookish. And so it was kind of up their alley. I mean, of course there are negative critics, neg negative reviews, but um, generally speaking, we're working in territory they like. And Kevin, I know you're gonna take the microphone in a moment and, and take some questions from the audience, but maybe I'll ask you, do you want to say anything about Pomeroy or Auchincloss or War and Peace, or the other things in addition to Jane Austen that you put in there and how you chose them? Well, War and Peace was, was really um, logical because it's something a lot of us read and it really has this feeling of society and people dressed up and this coherent society and all this stuff going on. It's also winter in New York, so they're all dressed up and it does seem like Moscow when you're walking in these cold streets. So that was that. Dr. Ward Wardell Pomeroy, the author of um, uh, Girls and Sex, he's at the Kinsey Institute. Um, he was at the Kinsey Institute in San Francisco. Have people heard all the stories about Kinsey and the Kinsey Institute and all? Really interesting because it was really fraudulent, really fraudulent, major fraud. Um, and so, um, I don't know, I, I guess there's two long production story there. Was there the third thing you mentioned? At the Auckland class at the end when Audrey's holding. Oh yeah, that, that was like the big book that all the people from this background, all the OBS, the O parents, the book they would have taken seriously would be The Rector, Rector of Justin by Louis Auckland Claus. So Louis Auckland Claus was sort of trying to follow in the footsteps of Henry James and Edith Wharton in sort of describing East Coast society. And the Rector of Justin was this bestseller, Pulitzer Prize winning book he wrote based on the, um, the, the rector or whatever it is of Groton School. So boarding school. So, so a very uh, socially prestigious boarding school where the, um, the, 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 the principal, the headmaster, was an Episcopal minister or rector. And so, yeah, Audrey Rouget. So we tried to put in things. So there's also, I think, you know, probably Decline of the West sitting next to his bedstand and things like that. So we tried to put in significant things. And persuasion. Yeah. Is Persuasion there too? Yes. In Audrey's room? It's in Tom's room. He's got a... Later on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so we should take some questions. And I think Kevin's up there to help us. Um, so there's already someone courageous with a hat. I love the movie. Thanks. So had you seen it before? I have not, no. Oh, good. But uh, I noticed a bunch of French influences. I was just wondering uh, what French films influence your filmmaking or Metropolitan? Well, um, sort of for me, my great um, French film experience was going at college, going to the local movie theater, and they had a double feature. They had um, uh, Truffaut's. Bed and Board, which is his marital comedy, and Antoine Doinel comedy, so it's sort of third feature in the Antoine Doinel autobiographical films, 400 Blows, um, Stolen Kisses, which is discussed and used as, as, as date, date film in, um, in Damsels in Distress. But the one I saw was Bed and Board, and I just adored it. I fell in love with the, um, I fell in love with the actress, um, uh, in it, I'm now married to the Latter-day equivalent of that actress. Um, thing, you know, when you're young, these things make big impressions. And I just adored the Truffaut film. And then I saw the Romer film called Claire's Knee. And I liked the knee. The knee was great. So there's a scene where Claire's getting on a ladder and the hero looks at her leg and it's fantastic. Um, but I hated the rest of the film, I have to say. And one of the sort of ironical things is that to sort of sell our films, to art film audiences and critics, they always say, oh, it's kind of an American Romer, an American Eric Romer, or, or, or a comedy Eric Romer. And Eric Romer's a great filmmaker, but initially I, I didn't get it at all. In fact, I still don't get it, but um, I can pretend to get it. And um, so that was a kind of key thing. And then I worked, my first job, was selling Spanish films. I wanted to be in the film business, I didn't know how to get in. I had the chance to try to sell some some uh, Spanish directors' films. No one else was trying to sell them. And they were very influenced by Truffaut, too. And they had done these cool, cool Spanish films. And so they were actually doing the indie comedies before 
Spike Lee and Jim Jarmusch and, uh, and John Sales were doing them. So I sort of got Truffaut through the Spaniards too. But thank you for that question. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, yes, the, the lady um, with the headband. Hi, um, I was just curious, if you were to remake uh, Metropolitan and put an implied it to today and the youth of today, how would you imply the same characteristics for like your characters, Tom and Audrey? Would it be difficult to apply to what the youth thinks of today? I, don't, I hope not. I don't think so. I mean, one really interesting thing happened to me. Like, the great thing for me right now, I hope it keeps being great, is um, I have a chance to work with some people at Amazon. And the first way I got to know them is that they, the, fir the lead guy there really liked Metropolitan, and they had the idea of open sourcing. The original idea of Amazon Studios is they're going to try to open source it to filmmakers to do their projects and put them up on the internet, you know, to have a kind of competition. And the ones they like, they put up on the internet. And, um, and so one of the first things uh, they did was licensed Metropolitan um, option it for remaking and they thought that there are a lot of really talented filmmakers who don't have written material and we, they could give them this idea this group of people with an outsider coming in and all that and they could you know remake it however they wanted and um, I don't think they should have tried to do similar milieus but let's say they could do a group of people at a summer place um, they could do anything where there's a sort of a cohesive, or the idea of a cohesive unit, even if it's not really that cohesive, but the outsider thinks it's cohesive. And then this other outsider guy coming in and how it affects the group and, and all that. So I would hope that you could essentially do that now. And I was sorry that my, my guild, the Writers Guild, came in and um, totally shot the idea down. They said you can't have people you know, working on spec and not getting paid and all that. And it's really sh a shame how unions and, and, and guilds and things like that, you know, kill ideas for opening businesses up, opening fields up to, to new people, you know, want to be filmmakers. Because I really don't think for your first thing, um, you don't need to get paid really. You want just to do it, to show it and have something. You'll get paid later on if you do a good job. And so that's a very good question. I think you could do that. Um, I think you could have characters like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> this film reminds me of uh, Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence, even though it's set in the 1890s, and the Scorsese, Scorsese movie, yeah. Yeah. which is, I think, from around 92, which is a couple did of Did you years. notice that those are the only two films the lead actress is in? Did you remember that? The only major film that, Audrey, that the Carolyn Freena, who plays Audrey Rouget, was cast in was that film. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> no, because I saw, she was I, cast I saw as, Age of Innocence a long, long time ago. Yeah, before, so she you know. had a part um, as um, Daniel Day Lewis's snobbish elder sister, who, or, or snobbish sister who is you know, making catty remarks and nasty remarks about other people. So do you see some thematic similarities or? Yes, I do. And that's the Scorsese film I like. Um, I think it's a great film. It's really beautiful. And um, it really interests me, the casting thing, because it, the, the situation for actors is so hard. Um, so Carolyn Farina playing in our film was a real stretch for her. She was a Queens girl. She really was from the John Travolta neighborhood in um, Saturday Night Fever. She comes from Queens. She sort of had a Queens accent. Um, and I, one thing I kind of got annoyed with um, Ed Clements, who is from Toronto, um, when her accent would slip, he would like laugh and oh. And um, she was really doing a brilliant job because she, she played it you know, in a beautiful and lovely way. But there were some sort of boring, um, very preppy blonde types who saw the film the first time and said, what is that girl doing playing this debutante part? You know, she doesn't look like it at all. And then the, ca but the casting, so she didn't get work for a, a while. And I'd ask the casting directors, why don't you bring in Carolyn Farina? Why don't you do something with Carolyn Farina? What's happening? Why isn't she being used? And they say, oh, yes, we bring her in a lot. Whenever we have a preppy or debutante 
par, we bring her in. But she was totally cast against type on that. And so um, when I was making the film Damsels in Distress a few years ago, we had to have a sort of local waitress at a coffee shop um, talk to the Greta Gerwig character, and we saw the tapes of the people, the casting people were sending us. It was sort of the same casting people, actually, who brought her in for the Debbie parts. <clears throat> and so I really wasn't happy with these uh, actors, so I called her up and said, could you do me this favor? Could you come in and play the waitress um, at the coffee shop? And I just kind of wanted it to be there to show people that she had huge range, she could play all these different things, and that if she wants to get back to acting, she's now, I think, a psychologist in public schools. Um, uh, but if she ever wanted to get back to acting, that she could have more in a reel. But thank you for mentioning Age of Innocence, because I think it's a beautiful film. And it's a film, I particularly like films, when I lose faith in them, I think they're not good, I get bored with them, and then suddenly they click in and and they become wonderful. I mean, I think it's kind of great when you doubt something. It's, he does tend to go on kind of long, and I think in a way he's hurt by the fact he has so much money and time and talent working for him. Like the beginning of Age of Innocence, I thought they were just photographing the wall, wall decor and the table decor, because it's also beautiful. And we, we didn't have that problem. For our, for our dance scene, we could only afford three tables which we moved around, and, and that just a few pieces of silverware we put on the tables because saying they'd cleared the places. Um, so anyway, thank you for that question. Are there any other comments or questions? Yes. So first I want to say what a real pleasure it is to have you out here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you. Screen these and talk with us about your, your films. It's been a great pleasure. The, this film for me is deeply personal and meaningful. It was one of the first things that made me realize that movies didn't have to be Hollywood and that there was another world of art and literature out there and that it could be put into film in this way. So thank you so much. I was about 19 or 20 when I first saw it and it was deeply, deeply meaningful to me. Thank you. I'd like to ask you, uh, why this for your first film? Is there an autobiographical element to this? What is the genesis for this? Okay, so I was desperate to make a film. I was getting older, it's my 30s. I was finally got into the business through the Spanish films. And um, uh, I was learning about it that way. Um, in 83, I had the chance to play the, the, the stupid American, the Bobo Americano in two, Ameri in two Spanish films. Um, one was shot um, with considerable resources in Madrid, and the other was just a catch-as-catch-can, tiny production in Manhattan. And I would started writing this screenplay for Barcelona. I was working on that as my first film. And in watching um, how a big film is done in Spain, I realized I should get a smaller idea that I could do in my home, home city, get a tiny idea I could do in, in New York with limited money. And so I shifted to this idea, and it started out the idea that, I remember watching on TV when I was young, a production of um, Shaw's Don Juan and Hal. And it's an elegant set with all these different characters having intellectual discussions and quite interesting. Actually, in that production, Lee Radswell, uh, Jackie Kennedy's sister, was in it. Um, and, um, uh, I thought they could just be having interesting conversations in Rome. And I started learning about production in New York, that if you have a $4,000 insurance policy, you can get a permit to shoot anywhere in New York. And legally, um, anything you see from the street, if you have a permit, you can film. So we could film the facade of the Plaza Hotel without Donald Trump's permission or whoever owned the hotel at that point. And um, we did kind of cut it pretty close because our idea was to, um, had the actors enter the back of the Plaza Hotel and then come out the front of the Plaza Hotel. And um, we got a um, ladder in front of the Plaza and the camera on top of it. And the people in the Plaza didn't know what was going on. And they started having security people with these counters and they sort of count how many times people would go by. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. And to get the ladder uh, there, our associate producer working for free, a, a Columbia Film School grad who had, had a project of his own, but was helping us out. He, um, he, 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 he rented this high ladder from an equipment house, 
and we had no transportation, so he got on a bus with this enormous ladder, and it was close to rush hour, and so the bus driver, at a certain point, the bus got quiet, said, you've got to get off. So he carried this enormous ladder like 20 blocks. He really earned his associate producer credit really well. Um, so it was really the, the reason, and also as a writer, it was like a two-week period. I remember that seemed to have its dramatic unities, and I was deeply, deeply depressed my first year in college, and I had no intention of going to parties of this kind. I was very radical and principled. Um, but I got invited, like Tom Townsend, I got invited. So I went, and I really had a great time. They're really funny, great people. And I, I retrospectively, I realized that, that by having these really funny, extravagant characters, it really helped uh, write, the, write the script. So that's why it was happening. And it's my, my, my most autobiographical thing. The other things aren't really so autobiographical. Thank you for that question. Um, this, uh, we're, we're speaking of 25 to 27 years after uh, Metropolitan. Uh, how has the independent film business changed since your first trio of films in the 90s uh, to these last couple uh, with Damsels in Distress and, uh, and the most uh, recent One Love and Friendship? Well, um, the, um, the, the film business has oddly returned to where it was in the 80s for, for independent filmmakers. It's really very similar now than it was in the 80s. And when I was trying to come back, because I had this horrible period of 12 years of not making a film, and I was trying to get um, my friends at Castle Rock to support um, Damsels in Distress, um, because they started talking about you know, getting star casting and getting a distributor and an equity partner and all these things that normally mean you're not going to make your film. I mean, it's not going to happen. You're not going to get stars. And and so I said, you know, I think I could go back and make a metropolitan kind of film with Damsels in Distress. It could be, it could be really cheap. It could be a $500,000 film. And, um, you know, that's sort of inflation for what metropolitan ended up costing. And um, the, the great people there, you know, were really stimulated by that and it ended up coming up privately just between the different partners of Castle Rock with the money they made from Seinfeld, you know, put money in and allowed us to make damsels in distress for more money than that. But they were given um, confidence because um, there's a really good company, Sony Classics, and they, they did a wonderful thing. Um, they told um, um, Castle Rock that they take the film, just writer, director, they just take the film that we did. We didn't have to start casting. And um, that was sort of really, that's sort of the green light for, for doing the film. And we got really exciting actresses um, and, and actors um, from now. And so Greta Gerwig emerging, uh, Anna Lee uh, Tipton, who's been in many films now, and uh, Caitlin Fitzgerald. And so that helped me come back. And, um, but, but, but now it's very similar. So I was inspired by Mumblecore when I came back. These are the guys making really inexpensive, interesting films, good comedies, using digital media. And the wonderful thing now is that the digital cameras are sensationally good, and, um, and they're not very expensive. And so the, the, the means of production are, are, are economical. One thing that I, it is really loud. Um, one thing that uh, I was wondering is, because talking about it being like modernized and redone and everything, yeah. do you think that it would be possible that it would, like it being modernized would retract from the ideas that was getting across um, and like some of the more subtle uh, points that I think it was making? Yeah, I mean, the ideas would have to be different. I mean, if someone used it as a template, um, they'd have to put their own ideas and their own experience into it and their own personal things and concerns. I mean, I really think it's important when you're working on a project that there's a lot in it that's really important to you and you really care about. And uh, I think you need everything you can to make it more significant to yourself. And so the person using a template, so you can say I was using a Jane Austen template or such and such template or J.D. Salinger template, but it had to be infused with whatever you know, the person making it is cares about. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, let's give Whit a hand for this Thank film. You. And for Thanks very much. <laughs>